OK, let's start the class discussion. Um, this week's questions are a bit bigger and a bit more ambiguous because we have reached the end of the novel, so we have the chance to think about the whole book. Uh, the first question uh, in chapter 14, how did Valentine convince Ender to continue his training? And is it the same thing that she did the last time he was going to give up? So I had the chance to talk with group one. And group one thinks that this is a very interesting and complicated situation. Because in both cases, Valentine gives Ender a very sincere message. But the message is entirely about how Ender is not like Peter. Um, and so in both cases, uh, Ender, what Ender says, how he reacts, um, is that Valentine does not understand his real thinking. So in the first instance, when he received the letter, he, his reaction was entirely negative. He realized that this letter is written for one purpose only, and that is to convince Ender that it is a real letter really from Valentine. In other words, to let him have contact with the one person in his life that he loves. And so he's angry because to him that means even Valentine is being manipulated by the military. And the fact that the letter only talks about Peter makes him even angrier because it tells him that the military doesn't care about Valentine's own feelings for him. They only care about how uh, about convincing him that he is not Peter. And yet. After receiving that letter, he does continue with his training. And group one pointed out that this may have to do with the results, the consequences of that letter. After he receives the letter, he goes to play the mind game. He goes to the end. He faces the snake. Um, but whereas before he would kill the snake and see his reflection as Peter, this time he kisses the snake and the snake turns into Valentine and they kind of like run away together through a crowd of Peters. And yet uh, he doesn't care that he's being surrounded by Peters. So it's a very symbolic scene, very symbolic image. And it seems to be saying that, um, at least for the letter, he wants something genuine from Valentine, not just a manipulated letter. But he wants to hear Valentine's actual communication and intention. Um, but he doesn't get it. But in the mind game, his unconscious tells him that the letter is sincere. Valentine did agree to write the letter. She did try very hard to show Ender that it is a real letter. Um, so the solution to his problem of wanting to be loved and wanting to be recognized as a human being, the solution is not in what Valentine uh, does, the specific actions or the specific letter. The solution is in her intention. She agrees to do it. She agrees to help uh, the military help Ender. Or you can flip that around. She agrees to help Ender help the military. Now, the second time in chapter 14, uh, Ender is on a lake. He doesn't want to leave. And so Graf brings Valentine over to visit him and they chat. And the important part of their conversation is also about Peter. And Valentine again says, you're not like Peter, etc. But then uh, at this point, Valentine says, do you want to beat Peter? Is that what you want? And he says, no, I want Peter to love me. 
Um, and, and at this point, Valentine thinks that Peter doesn't love anyone. So the only response that she can give is, I love you, Ender. So there, I think there are two things we can say about this scene. First is her idea that Peter doesn't love anyone. I think we, it's safe to say that Ender also knows this, and this is why he is in despair. He wants something that is impossible. But because Valentine knows the same thing, by saying to Ender that I love you, she admits that Peter will never love him. And that means that Valentine and Peter are in the same, uh, sorry, Valentine and Ender are in the same situation. So by saying, I love you, Ender, she's telling Ender that I know what you want. I know how you're feeling. It's an act of empathy. It's an act of recognition. She recognizes what he truly wants. And maybe it's that connection that uh, makes Ender want to continue again. That even though he doesn't get Peter's love, he at least can protect the one person who understands him, uh, which is Valentine. The second thing we can say about this conversation is that maybe this explains why he kissed the snake in the game. If the snake always represents Peter, then Valentine's letter forced Ender to face himself to face what he truly wants, which is love from his brother. And this expressed, this love expressed itself in the game uh, when Ender's character kisses the snake. And so by facing his true desires, uh, it is a kind of self recognition. He truly sees himself. And so he is freed from the mental obstacles that had been holding him back. Something like that. Questions? Okay, if not, um, let's move on to question two. Uh, in the final fight, when Petra breaks down, Ender thinks that he had no time to worry about her or to feel guilty about what he had done to her. Uh, I'm answering this one. I agree half and disagree half. I agree with the, the half that says he had no time now to stop and worry or to take care of his team, to comfort them because they're in the middle of a battle. But I disagree that he uh, apparently doesn't do these actions after the battle. After the emergency is over, I think for a leader, the most important thing is always to take care of your team. But in the novel, it tells us that uh, it very briefly summarizes the next few fights by saying that Ender now had to also worry that his commanders would would start fainting and failing. And so he also had to calculate how tired each person is and had to rotate people. And therefore, sometimes he had to work with commanders that he trusted just a little bit less. So the focus of this part of the novel is on the pressure on Ender, and it does not talk about how he deals with Petra. And it, in fact, it implies that he doesn't deal with Petra. He doesn't comfort her. He doesn't reassure her. I think that's a big mistake. Even if, uh, as the novel says, Petra became a broken commander, became less brave, more careful, uh, Ender's behavior toward Petra would also be an example to the other team members. Um, by not comforting Petra after the battle, the message that Ender is sending 
is that the health of the commanders doesn't matter to him. The only thing that matters is that they win. And it's true, winning is the most important thing, but they have to win as a team. If they can't trust each other as a team, it makes it harder for them to win every fight. Now, the second part of this question asks, uh, is this the same for the way that Graf treated Ender during his training? In other words, isolating him, not giving him help, giving him challenge upon challenge, not giving him comfort, not reassuring him. Are these two situations the same? I think no. And the difference is that Graf's goal is not to win any fight. His goal is to produce a commander, to produce the best military leader in the world. And this goal is not the kind of, it's not like a race, right? In a race, if you pass the finish line, there's nothing else to worry about. But if you're educating someone, if you're training someone, you need to make sure that that person can continue after the training is done. So I think that um, the situations are different. Um, and also because for Graf, the training only ends when the war ends because the fights are pretend training, right? And it thinks that it's still training. So in terms of the training method, the training period will only end after the war ends. So if the goal is training and the training requires isolation, then Graf can only comfort Ender after the war ends. Otherwise, uh, according to Graf's logic, Ender will realize that somebody cares about him and may help to protect him. And that would weaken his abilities as a leader. That does not make 100% sense, but that's how Graf is thinking. And if uh, we go by Graf's logic, then Graf not only should not comfort Ender, but he cannot comfort Ender. So in terms of the logic of the situation in the novel, Graf is correct not to comfort Ender. But Ender is wrong in not comforting Petra after the battle. Now, this leads directly to question three. Because question three is when Graf and Mazurakim do comfort Ender before the end of the war. But they do it in a way that Ender does not realize it is happening. He is so traumatized that he has nightmare after nightmare and reality and nightmare blur together. So when these two do comfort him, he thinks that it's just another dream. But the way that it's written in the book, I think it's clear that it's not a dream. If you uh, look at page 288. Uh, first paragraph, line two. He thought he saw Valentine sometimes, and sometimes Peter, sometimes his friends from the battle school, and sometimes the aliens vivisecting him or taking him apart. Once it seemed very real when he saw Colonel Graf bending over him, speaking softly to him like a kind father. But then he woke up and found only his enemy, Mazer Rackham. So if you notice the progression of this scene from the end of the last page, it, first it says that he sees faces that weren't real. Then it says he sees the faces of actual characters that we know are not in the scene. And then at the end it says he sees a person that we know is in the scene, and the novel says that it seemed very real. So I think we can conclude that Graf really did come and uh, 
comfort him at night. In fact, if we reverse engineer this, if we take it apart to see why this paragraph is written like this, we can even say that this entire paragraph exists to tell the reader that graph does comfort Ender. Uh, the goal of this paragraph is to give us this information in a way that would not let Ender know that this is happening. So the reader knows, but the but Ender does not know. And that's why this paragraph is written as a dream. But that's not the question, right? Question three is when has Ender received the blessing that he isn't supposed to know about before? And are they the same kind of blessing? Group four, do you have thoughts? So even though group four does not remember when this has happened before, it has in fact happened before. Um, a few weeks ago, we talked about when Ender was assigned to uh, Salamander Army and he leaves his first group of friends and Ali says to him, Salam. And the novel tells us Ender does not know what it means, but it feels like a gift that is very sacred so sacred that he himself was not allowed to understand what the gift was. So at least to me, I think the logic of these two scenes is quite similar. Someone is giving Ender a blessing, but Ender is not allowed to know what it is. Now, when we talked about that earlier scene, uh, I think it was group three, they concluded that nothing really prevented Ender from not understanding. If he had known more about the world, maybe he would have understood more. So it's not a restriction. It's, it's just his own uh, ignorance. But in terms of Ender, if we look at it from his perspective, um, he feels like the reason he doesn't understand, the reason a lie doesn't explain to him is because he's not allowed to understand. So the same logic here, Graf cannot let Ender know that he really is offering Ender comfort. As group four said, uh, Ender is not allowed to know that it is real. It, he must think that it is part of his dream. And so do you think it might be the same blessing? Why would Graf Comfort Ender by touching him with affection and gentleness. Well, at this part, uh, in this moment, Ender is suffering day after day, losing sleep. His body is breaking down. So it does seem to me that Graf wants for Ender the same thing that Ali wants for Ender, which is peace. He wants Ender to to survive and to, to be at peace with himself. It's not, to, to me at least, this is not the kind of message that says, I hope you win, right? Because that kind of message Graf could have just told Ender when Ender is awake. It's only a kind of message that does not fit with the war that Graf has to secretly give Ender. Uh, and peace is, of course, the very opposite of war. So to me, I think it's the same kind of blessing.
Questions? All right. Number four. In the last battle, Ender says, I don't care anymore, and then he wins. Has this kind of thing happened to him before? Uh, and why does it bring him success? So this is to question uh, group three, and I had the chance to talk to group three during the break. Uh, and they bring up the example of his last fight in battle school, the one where he's fighting two armies. And before the fight begins, he basically says, uh, it's unfair, no reasonable commander would take on this fight. And yet he has to fight. He has no choice. So this is the one where he gets Bean to tie people together into a formation and they send uh, the minimum number of soldiers through the enemy's gate. And so they win technically. They don't win by force. They win according to the rules of the game. Uh, now, in the last fight in the book, it, it's very similar. The, the human army is overwhelmed, outnumbered. There's no possible way they could fight fairly and win. Uh, and so Ender thinks, OK, if you don't give me a fair fight, I'm not going to fight fairly. So instead of attacking the enemy, he attacks the planet. And so this is something that Group 3 pointed out. In both cases, Ender broke the rules, but he didn't give up the mission. Uh, that kind of I don't care anymore attitude allowed him to think outside the box. In battle school fights, uh, you are expected to defeat the other army. In war, usually, you hope to defeat the other army. But in both cases, Ender finds another way to end the fight or the war without having to defeat an overwhelming number of enemies. The deeper question here is, if he really doesn't care, why does he continue with his mission? Why doesn't he just give up? Group three has a couple of answers to this. The first is that he still cares about Earth, even if he doesn't care about his teachers or his grades, even if he doesn't care about his graduation, even if he doesn't care about his teachers or the specific mission, he does care about the war in general. He does want humanity to survive. Maybe not humanity. He wants Valentine to survive, according to group one. So for Valentine's sake, uh, he still tries to win the war. Even if it's against every like he's doing it not for not because the teachers want him to. He's doing it only for Valentine, for his own selfish reasons. Now, another possible answer is that this is a kind of rebellion against the teachers. The teachers, according to Ender's view, the teachers give him an impossible mission. And they expect him to do well. But if he doesn't care anymore, what he's saying is he doesn't care about how the teachers view him. He doesn't care about their evaluations, their assessments. He's in English, we call this he's beating them at their own game. In Chinese, we call this uh, or something like that. I, my Chinese is not very good, but you know what I mean, right? Using the enemy's uh, strategy against them. In this case, Ender does believe that the immediate enemy is the teacher. In the last battle, it's because Mazer Rackham tells him that it is Mazer who is designing the simulations. In the earlier battle, 
uh, he is already convinced that it is the teachers who are fighting Ender using other armies as a weapon. So in both cases, he thinks that the immediate enemy during training is the teacher. So if he can win the mission by not following the teacher's rules, that is also a kind of victory against the teacher. It's a it's a it's a victory against the teacher's authority. It's saying I can achieve what you want me to achieve, even if I don't follow your rules. Why do I have to follow rules that make no sense? Um, we have to remember that at this point, Ender does not know the final battle is real. He still thinks he's fighting Mazer Rackham. And in fact, this is part of the discussion I had with group three, which is, would it be different if Ender knew it was a real war? Uh, and group three thinks it would be different. And that, in fact, this is the whole point of why the adults won't tell him it's a real war. If Ender knew it was a real war, he wouldn't just care about winning. He would care about the costs. He would worry about what would happen if he loses. He would also, the teachers probably don't know this, but he would also worry about how many aliens he's killing. So many considerations that are not directly related to winning. But winning is the only thing that the military wants Ender to care about. And so they don't tell him it's a real war. And so why does this attitude bring Ender success? Because in both cases, he is also focused on winning, but not for the same reasons as the teachers want him to win and or not in order to impress the teachers. But winning for his own reasons and in his own way. OK, questions? Group three, did I miss anything that you wanted to say? No? OK, good. Question five. Group two, this is your question. You are within range of the microphone. <laughs> so after the war ends, Ender becomes a colony governor, which is a different kind of leadership than military leadership. Do you think Ender uses the same skills? Do you think being a good military leader has prepared him to be a good colony governor? Why or why not? OK, so may maybe I will start to answer from the second part. <laughs> so I think that maybe being a battle leader, and uh, that means that when and there was a soldiers, I think that there are some qualities that he have when I read the book. So maybe the first one I see is that I think that Ender, he focus, he lay a lot of emphasis on practice. Maybe he believe that practice can make perfect. So I can see from many, in many things in the book, Anders, he tried to prove himself by practice, by practicing. And even when he moved to another new team, like he will ask Petra, you have, have Petra to have practice or teach him how to shoot. And he, he's always the first one to do the practice and ask himself. So I think practice is quite important. And the second one is that I think that Ander, he has the quality of knowing the people around him. That means that he would try to understand who is good at something or who is weakness at some who is weakness in something or who are, and he tried to make good use of the people around them. And the second part. And the third one is that I do believe that Andrew quite understand about his target or his object for everything and he will stick for it. For example, I can see that he, they always said the enemy's, the enemy's door go 
the enemies that get is done, right? I, I think that when he finds that everything, or he, he he's in confused, that would remind him to go back to the his first ideas. Why why he's here? So I would think that if he has the quality. He knows what he wants or what is to be here. And the fourth one is that uh, he always think, try to think out of the box. That's just like the, what the teacher says, he always breaks the rules. Because when I, when I read a book, I would, come, I would be so convinced that why the characters in the books, they are all the kids, and very young kids. I always think that maybe the author, the writer, he tried to give us that maybe if you are just like a new babies, you are new, and that means that you are out of limitation, right? So maybe you have you are quite potential. You don't have the bad habits. You you don't have to be constrained. Yeah. So that's the full quality, I think. And um, maybe from the the book, the the from the 300. 2014 or 2060, right? So I see now he's the already a governor, right? Uh, I would just try to do the book. Maybe it's a word in Ender's heart, in his mind, right? He he seems the word is like a utopian. <laughs> uh, he try to make everything. It seems that everything is in is trying to balance. Yeah. So I was think that that would be the final goal for him, and it's what he. The qualities that he have has already made him become what he is now. So I think. Thank you. That was a very well structured answer. Um, so I, I want to ask you a follow up question. You mentioned four main points. I guess we can say four point one main points. You talked about um, his emphasis on practice, his understanding of people, his creativity, thinking outside the box. And also that he has a clear vision. He knows what he wants. And in the case of being a governor, his vision is harmony with the planet, something like that, with the environment. So I think we can say his goal is to help his colony survive. But I wanted to ask you about the third one, creativity. It's true, as a military leader, he often demonstrated creativity, and that's how he won. But as a governor, do we have examples of him being creative and thinking outside the box? I, I would think that maybe the to 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 be the governor in the county is uh, less a new experience for him, and uh, be on the earth has nobody has the same experience like him as him. So I was thinking maybe he, he has something in his mind and he tried to realize, uh, try to conduct his own ideas. So he, I was thinking that maybe he has some, some, some way of creating activities, not like others, because that's a new world. He has never seen. He is in a world when he was in the, in the, in the, on the earth, right? That's the something that he has been seen. So how he can be created a world like this, a uh, place like Utopian. So I was thinking that would be his creativity, right? Thank you, yes, that makes sense. He left Earth as a six-year-old boy. So he has never learned anything about governing or uh, helping other people to build a society. So yes, in terms of his personal experience, all of this requires his creativity. And perhaps that is not very clear from the novel because this section on page 314 to 316 is written as a summary. Um, and so we are looking at these events from the outside, right? We don't really have a clear idea of what Ender is thinking in this period. So what we see are the results. And it just so happens that these results, uh, living in harmony with nature, getting along with your neighbors, they all seem to be common sense good ideas. So in that sense, we, we uh, it, it takes a bit more effort to notice how much creativity Ender needs to use to achieve those results. It's kind of like, um, 
there's a there's a joke in English. Everyone knows that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, but how many remember that he also invented the cat door? The door to let your cat in and out of the house. And the, the point is few people remember that because cat doors are so obvious. It's like who remembers the person who invented the wheel? We all think it's just an obvious idea, and so we often forget how hard it must have been for the first person to think of it. OK, so thank you, um, group two. I think your answer makes a lot of sense, uh, and the interesting one of the interesting things about this answer is that it kind of goes against what the novel itself says. At the bottom of page 314, the last paragraph. He worked hard on the new world. He quickly understood the differences between military and civilian leadership and governed by persuasion rather than fiat and by working as hard as anyone at the tasks involved in setting up a self-sustaining economy. The point I want to focus on is it says that he governed by persuasion rather than fiat, which means uh, he had to convince people to agree with him instead of ordering them to follow him. But from your answer, it sounds like as a military leader, he also had to do this. You mentioned that he had to have a good understanding of people. Um, and I agree. So. On the surface, it looks like soldiers have to follow their generals. But we know that there's a big difference between soldiers who want to follow and soldiers who don't want to follow. So yes, at the end of the day, as a military leader, his soldiers have to follow his orders. But to become a good military leader, Ender has to convince them to follow him. So at the end of the day, it's also similar to what he has to do as a civilian governor. OK, thank you. Other groups? Now that we have finished the novel, do you have questions about the whole book? OK, next week we're going to read the author's introduction at the beginning. Uh, it's at the beginning, but I think it makes more sense after you read the whole novel. Uh, the introduction is the only place in the book where the author speaks for himself. And he sort of gives us the ideas behind uh, why he wrote the book, how he wrote the book, and his reactions to how other people have received the book, like uh, other people's thoughts and evaluations and he gives a response. So next week we can think about whether his ideas and responses make sense or not. I think we also have some questions about the structure of the book next week also. So questions like, um, now that you have read the last chapter, did you notice any foreshadowing Fubi in the first chapter? Something like that. OK, we have a little time left, so let's look um, more deeply at chapter 13. So in the previous chapter, uh, is when we see Peter and Valentine trying to take over the world. So the beginning of chapter 13 is a reaction to that. Children, brother and sister, they'd layered themselves five times through the nets, writing for companies that paid for their memberships, that sort of thing. Devil of a time tracking them down. So this tells us that they're talking about Peter and Valentine. What are they hiding? Could be anything. 
The most obvious thing to hide, though, is their ages. The boy is 14, the girl is 12. Which one is Demosthenes? The girl, the 12 year old. Pardon me, I don't really think it's funny, but I can't help laugh. So this tells us that this second person is laughing. All this time we've been worried, all the time we've been trying to persuade the Russians not to take Demosthenes too seriously, we held up Locke as proof that Americans weren't all crazy warmongers. Brother and sister, pubescent, pubescent means they're still going through puberty, and their last name is Wigan. Ah, coincidence? 228. The Wigan is a third. They are one and two. Oh, excellent. The Russians will never believe that Demosthenes and Locke aren't as much under our control as the Wigan. So, like, we've seen Peter and Valentine taking over the world from their perspective. Now we get the perspective of outside viewers, generals, world leaders, and it, apparently it looks like the Russians are very paranoid about what's going on. And so these two leaders, I think one is Graf, don't know who the other one is. These two leaders are thinking about how they should deal with the Russians. Is there a conspiracy? Is someone controlling them? We have been able to detect no contact between these two children and any adult who might be directing them. That is a very careful answer. It's not, no, there's no conspiracy. It's, we could not detect any contact between them and any adult who could be able to control them. There are many different ways to negate that sentence. It's a very careful lawyer sentence. And so the, the other person responds by pointing this out. That is not to say that someone might not have invented some method you can't detect. It's hard to believe that two children. I interviewed Colonel Graf when he arrived from the battle school. Ah, OK, so these two people are not Colonel Graf. It, apparently these are more important people. It is his best judgment that nothing these children have done is out of their reach. Their abilities are virtually identical with the Wigan. Notice the, how they never say Ender's name. They don't say Ender, they don't say Andrew, they say the Wigan, the one and only. It's like even these generals and world leaders also believe in the myth of the undefeatable Ender Wigan. It's like the, there's a kind of taboo on his name, Yoga Minghui, because he's such an important uh, person. Only their temperaments are different. Temperament here is kind of like personality, Xing. What surprised him, however, was the orientation of the two personas. A persona is like a character. Demosthenes is definitely the girl, but Graf says the girl was rejected for battle school because she was too pacific, too conciliatory, and above all, too empathic. Uh, empathic. Okay, pacific means peaceful. Why do we call it the Pacific Ocean? Because when the Spanish people climbed up the mountain on California and they saw the ocean, it looked like a very peaceful body of water. Little did they know that the Pacific was not only the biggest ocean, but also the most violent ocean. The second word conciliatory. Is the adjective for concede, 承让. So conciliatory means 
likely to concede, wanting to compromise. And of course, empathic means uh, having empathy, more commonly empathetic. Definitely not Demosthenes. And the boy has the soul of a jackal, Cai Lang. Wasn't it Locke that was recently praised as the only truly open mind in America? <laughs> Peter. <laughs> It's hard to know what's really happening, but Graf recommended, and I agree, that we should leave them alone, not expose them. Make no report at this time, except that we have determined that Locke and Demosthenes have no foreign connections and have no connections with any domestic group either, except those publicly declared on the nets. In other words, give them a clean bill of health. Now, do you understand what's going on here? They see two incredibly smart kids trying to take over the world. But because there is no immediate danger from a different government or from a different group that is against the government, they're willing to let them continue. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were the military, I would want to control them. To me, this says that they still don't take Peter and Valentine seriously. They seem to think that as long as no foreign government or terrorist group is controlling them, that they cannot cause any danger. I don't think I agree. I think that if a 14 year old and a 12 year old can work together to take over the world, I think they're pretty dangerous. I would want to control them or at least put some limits around what they can do. So even now the adults are underestimating the children. Uh, OK, two to eight last paragraph. I know Demosthenes seems dangerous in part because he or she has such a wide following. He because the name Demosthenes is a male name. But I think it's significant that the one of the two of them who is most ambitious has chosen the moderate wise persona. And they're still just talking. They have influence, but no power. Two to nine. In my experience, influence is power. Which is true. Uh, if you were paying attention to American politics in 2016, you would have realized that Trump had power because he had influence. Even though most people in the media, in the government, anybody with a brain basically thought that he was decidedly not the best choice. He had influence and that's how he gained power. Anyway, continuing. If we ever find them getting out of line, we can easily expose them. So the answer is we'll let them go for now, but we can always blackmail them in the future. So this is a kind of control. They're putting themselves one step away from control. Only in the next few years, the longer we wait, the older they get, and the less shocking it is to discover who they are. You know what the Russian troop movements have been? There's always the chance that Demosthenes is right. So this is very important information. This tells us that Peter and Valentine have been right so far in their analysis. They don't have the military information, but the military is saying, you know, they are pretty accurate. Uh, and if you remember from the previous chapter, Demosthenes is saying that Russia is going to attack as soon as we defeat the aliens. So what if Demosthenes is right? In which case, we'd better have Demosthenes around, all right. 
We'll show them clean for now, but watch them. And I, of course, have to find ways of keeping the Russians calm. So this entire dialogue tells us that Peter and Valentine are entirely correct and that we can expect them to continue because the adults are not going to stop them for now. And so that leads to the opening of this chapter. In spite of all her misgivings, Valentine was having fun being Demosthenes. Her column, Zhuanlan, was now being carried on practically every news net in the country. And it was fun to watch the money pile up in her attorney's accounts. Every now and then she and Peter would, in Demosthenes name, donate a carefully calculated sum to a particular candidate or cause. A cause here meaning some kind of uh, issue related organization. Enough money that the donation would be noticed but not so much that the candidate would feel she was trying to buy a vote. So notice one small detail. It's always Demosthenes who makes a donation, never Locke. Because Locke is supposed to be high minded and fair and equal. He's not supposed to support one side over the other, but Demosthenes is supposed to be a populist, Ming Cui. She's supposed to try to change people's minds and get people to agree with her. So that's why it's Demosthenes making donations. It makes more sense. She was getting so many letters now that her newsnet had hired a secretary to answer certain classes of routine correspondence for her. The fun letters from national and international leaders, <laughs> she called them fun, which reminds us that she's still a child. Sometimes hostile, sometimes friendly, always diplomatically trying to pry into Demosthenes mind. Those she and Peter read together, laughing in delight sometimes that people like this were writing to children and didn't know it. Sometimes though she was ashamed. Father was reading Demosthenes regularly. He never read Locke, or if he did, he said nothing about it. At dinner, though, he would often regard them with some telling point Demosthenes had made in that day's column. Peter loved it when father did that. See, it shows that the common man is paying attention. But it made Valentine feel humiliated for father. If he ever found out that all this time I was writing the columns he told us about and that I didn't even have half the things I wrote, they didn't, didn't even believe half the things I wrote. He would be angry and ashamed. Of course, that's not the main reason why she feels ashamed for her father. It's because Demosthenes is the populist. He's the, the character of Demosthenes is the one who is arguing that we should fight Russia now. We should be prepared for war. Things that Valentine does not believe. Things that she thinks ordinary people with a brain would not believe. And yet here her own father is believing it. It's like if your father voted for Trump. At school, she once nearly got them in trouble when her history teacher assigned the class to write a paper contrasting the views of Demosthenes and Locke as expressed in two of their early columns. Wow, so they have become so famous that teachers are teaching their material. <laughs> Valentine was careless and did a brilliant job of analysis. As a result, she had to work hard to talk the principal out of having her essay published on the very news net that carried Demosthenes' column. Right, because if her essay is published next to Demosthenes' essay, it would be very obvious that it is the same person. Peter was savage about it. You write too much like Demosthenes. You can't get published. I should kill Demosthenes now. You're getting out of control. Notice that these are four complete sentences connected by commas, which is not grammatical. It's, a, it's an effect. It, the effect is to um, make us feel like Peter is saying all of this very quickly, like it's his immediate reaction. 
Like he's angry. He's not able to control what he's saying. If he raged about that blunder, Peter frightened her still more when he went silent. It happened when Demosthenes was invited to take part in the president's council on education for the future. A blue ribbon panel that was designed to do nothing but do it splendidly. It's called a blue ribbon panel because like when the group presents its report, it's on a po it's on stage and behind a podium and on the podium will be a blue ribbon. It's a kind of like a gathering of uh, thought leaders in society to give uh, recommendations. But of course, the government doesn't have to listen to those recommendations. And that's why she says that it is designed to do nothing. Valentine thought Peter would take it as a triumph, but he did not. Turn it down, he said. Why should I, she asked. It's no work at all, and they even said that because of Demosthenes' well-known desire for privacy, they would net all the meetings. They would all be online. It makes Demosthenes into a respectable person, and, and you love it that you got that before I did. Peter's jealous. <laughs> Peter, it isn't you and me. It's Demosthenes and Locke. We made them up. They aren't real. Besides, this appointment doesn't mean they like Demosthenes better than Locke. It just means that Demosthenes has a much stronger base of support. Which is a very smart thing to say. They invite Demosthenes because she has more influence. You knew he would. Appointing him pleases a large number of Russian haters and chauvinists. A chauvinist is a patriot, but in a bad sense. 就是愛國者, it wasn't supposed to work this way. Locke was supposed to be the respected one. He is. Real respect takes longer than official respect. Peter, don't be angry at me because I've done well with the things you told me to do. Let's stop here. So before next week, please finish the author's introduction, and you might also want to refresh your memory about what happened in the early parts of the book. <laughs>